Uh, thanks. I'm honored to be here to have been chosen, uh, especially given the remarkable uh, set of soon-to-be former colleagues uh, who were nominated. I've been thrilled to hear the talks already tonight, and I'm looking forward uh, to those yet to come. Still, it was ironic being chosen to give this talk given a couple of weeks before Art History voted not to put me up for a promotion to associate, and I was tempted to drop out. But someone, at least one person with access to a computer and a virus, uh, wanted to hear what I might have to say about my work and about the humanities. And so even though my career is now a smoldering tire fire, <laughs> I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, there remains the question of where the whole thing uh, came apart, whether the problem is that this sort of interdisciplinary work is the kind of thing that Yale has trouble recognizing and incorporating, or whether the mere fact that uh, a number of graduate students voted for me should be taken as evidence that they still have a lot to learn, uh, or something else entirely. That's a question I leave as an exercise uh, for the auditor. Uh, this may seem personal, uh, which brings me to my work. <laughs> One of the great strengths of Hollywood cinema is its ability to capture the difficulties of separating the personal and the economic, of separating, to put it in the grander language of long ago, love and labor. In The Godfather, this appears as so much talk about things that are not personal, but just business. In Aaron Brockovich, uh, it appears like this. Aaron's uh, theatrical coughing here is the performed, embodied materialization of the inextricability of her immersion in her profession. And the reason that Hollywood movies are good at this is because the mutual implication of work and life on screen borrows its intensity and its incisiveness from the mutual implication of work and life off screen, the sort of immersive embodiment that's necessary to make the system go. That sort of immersion may be easy to see in a movie, but it typifies, I argue, life in the professional middle class. Hollywood as an industry adds two things, an aesthetic dimension and a need to do much of its business in public. Woody Allen famously noted that if show business weren't a business, it would be called show show. <laughs> but the corollary also holds that if it didn't depend deeply on the aesthetic artifacts it produces, it would be called business business. For me, Hollywood is the paradigm of collective aesthetic endeavor under highly capitalized conditions, and it devotes a good deal of its energies to representing that collectivity to itself and to us. At one extreme, as in the Blues Brothers here, that immersion can look just like a prison. At another, it can look like biological replication. Animation films have this in all of their credits, all the babies who were born over the time of it. <laughs> Still, Hollywood remains a business. Today, the entertainment industry is not only one of the great engines of the American economy alongside aerospace, software, education, uh, but it is the business more Americans know more about than any other. How it makes money and how much, its costs and its revenues. We know or we can quickly find out about its product cycles, franchises, reboots, star careers, revenue streams, creative processes, data vulnerabilities, and so much more. And on top of that, the industry for a hundred years has wanted us to know. In the post-studio era, when every movie is a package put together from scratch, it's not simply the studio and its public relations para-industries that want us to know. It's the situation of every creative worker that she must simultaneously collaborate and achieve sufficient individual recognition that she will get hired again. At the same time, the studios, those mere providers of capital, aspire to contain the enormous financial risks that they undertake by guaranteeing the continuity of their own production. They make franchise films, they leverage design identities across media so that, uh, the, sorry, so that the Pepsi ad inside Top Gun looks like the Diet Pepsi ad outside Top Gun, so that the costumes in Boys in the Hood can reappear on a non-player character in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, and they bleed their logos into the very story worlds, oops, sorry, the very story worlds uh, of the films that they distribute. Those are the openings of four different films from four different studios. In what I call neoclassical Hollywood, studios aspire to the sort of aesthetic necessity that they must perforce borrow from their immersed employees. So my first book, 
was an attempt to reestablish, oops, sorry, I don't know why the Pepsi ended up there. All right, was an attempt to reestablish the importance of, that is to say, the system shaping agency of individual movies inside the corporations that produce them and inside a much broader mediascape. These days, uh, there's a good deal of anxiety over the place of the humanities in the university. And some of the burgeoning areas of humanistic research offer strategies for perhaps putting that anxiety to rest. Digital approaches, studies of affect, the post-human, or sound. But the anxiety itself rubs up against one of the perennial humanistic questions, the question of our finitude, one that I usually put in pragmatic or experiential terms. How do we make progress in situations where we know the system as a whole has outstripped our efforts? And what is being in such a situation like? My uh, two current projects, one on Hollywood numbers and one on audio tape recording, look for answers to those questions in areas of the digital and so the sonic. But I'll stick with the Hollywood example today. These days, when the system as a whole outstrips our capacities, we usually turn to numbers. In Hollywood math and aftermath, I peg the emergence of a popular data culture in the United States to Obama's election in 2008, reaching a peak here in 2012, and the attempt to reckon with the financial crisis. Hollywood has long had a fascination with numbers, their abstraction, their concrete manipulation, their fungibility, their romance. This is Ferris Bueller proposing to Sloan at the Merck. Uh, but with the advent of big data and an audience for tales of big data, Hollywood could re-engage with its financial and aesthetic questions in a new context. And here is the way that Moneyball attempts to explain and demonstrate where value comes from and what makes for valuable work. So using this equation on the upper left right here, I'm projecting that you need to win at least 99 games in order to make it to the postseason. You need to score at least 814 runs in order to win those games and allow no more than 645 runs. What's this? This is the code that I've written for our year-to-year -year projections. This is building in all the intelligence that we have to project players. Okay. It's about getting things down to one number. Using stats the way we read them, we'll find value Right, from data point to pixel to half tone. And here, and I realize there's a lot of text, is a credulous account of Hollywood production that makes a fetish of the anti-sentimental macho posturing of relativity productions, allowing its head Ryan Kavanaugh to imagine himself as Odysseus, binding himself to the mast of what he calls at the bottom the model, and refusing to be seduced by the siren song of what he calls creative decisions. Now, much more could be said about the parallels and the differences between Moneyball and what this calls the Moneyballers of Hollywood, but today I'm sticking to irony and allegory. Two weeks before Moneyball was to shoot, Sony president Amy Pascal fired director Steven Soderbergh because she felt his vision of the script would not pay off. Baseball movies are a tough sell globally, even when they have Brad Pitt in them. Um, it's hard to know which experience, though, is worse, getting fired because your boss doesn't believe in your vision or never getting hired because your potential bosses like Ryan Kavanaugh believe in numbers more than people. But it's easy to see that if you want people to do their best, most creative work together, you need more agency than Kavanaugh's model lets you believe you have. You may not need to share a vision, but you do need to share what I'll call a belief that you are committed to the consequences of your mistakes. The scenes in Moneyball in which Jonah Hill has to learn to fire players are aesthetically better because they are properly haunted by the film's own backstory. And the films that Steven Soderbergh made during his sudden and forced hiatus, Magic Mike in particular, are better because they are properly haunted as well. I might say the same about much of the humanities work I admire and sought to inspire here at Yale. Thanks. <laughs>